evening, everyone, and a very, very warm welcome from International Cat Care on International Cat Day. I hope you're having a fantastic day and have been celebrating with your cats. Um, we're going to go into a live Q&A where we've got some fantastic experts with us who are joining me um, who are here to answer all your questions, regardless of whether they're on cat-friendly resources or you've got other burning questions about cats, um, please fire them towards us. We can't sadly answer any questions specific to particular health problems or behavior problems because you would need to see, see your vet um, for those. But anything else, we're here to help you. So without further ado, I'd love to introduce our panel. I'm Sarah Ellis. I'm Head of Cat Advocacy at International Cat Care. Um, my background has been in feline behaviour and welfare research before I joined the charity. Um, and I'm co-author of the book, The Trainable Cat. Uh, next up, we've got Alex Taylor. Give us a wave, Alex. <laughs> Alex is a registered veterinary nurse. She recently joined International Cat Care. Um, she's all about being cat friendly and is a big cat friendly advocate and really, really keen on cat friendly nursing. Next up, we've got Vicky Holtz. Give us a wave, Vicky. Um, Vicky has had a, a fantastic and wonderful career um, working with many caregivers with problem behaviours in cats, but now we are very, very lucky to have her on board working with us um, pretty much exclusively on unknown cats, so that's her, her expert, expert area for tonight. Then we have Linda Ryan, give us a wave. Linda is, <laughs> Linda is um, a registered veterinary nurse. She's also a professional animal trainer and she is also an accredited animal behaviorist. So she's got a lot of strings to her bows. Um, she's very, very keen on cooperative care. So training our cats or working with our cats to be um, consensual participants in their care. So any questions on um, specific to how we can help look after them, prevent behavior problems, et cetera, training them, Linda's your lady. And last but not least, we've got lovely Zazie Todd, who's joining us from Canada. Um, Zazie is a phenomenal writer when it comes to cats. Um, she's written, she writes several blogs, um, including the Companion Animal Psychology blog. And she's very recently authored the book, Her, The Science of Making Your Cat Happy, which is a fantastic read if you've not already read it. She also has her own behavior and training business as well. So I think we'll get going then with some questions. Oh, can I just say one last thing? Sorry, when you send your question through to us, when you type it through, it'd be fantastic if you could tell us where in the world you are, because um, it'll help us better answer your question. And also, um, if you're a, a cat owner, a caregiver, if you work with cats, and in what profession you work with cats, that'll really help us to tailor our answers for you. Okay, so we're ready. Have we got a first question coming in? Here we go. So we've got a question here from Pat Brown on Facebook. Um, and I'm going to direct this one to you, Linda. Um, it says, how can I persuade my ginger neuter Tom not to fight? Well, that's a really interesting question in terms of what do we mean by that? So is he out and about fighting with the neighborhood cats? Or do we have a problem with many cats in the household that we're having a, a difficulty with there? Um, but I'm going to assume that he's out and about and it's really difficult because he's got his territory, which is meaningful to him and where he lives, and he's going to feel safe there. And if he's in a place where there's a lot of cats in the environment, they've also got their own territories. And sometimes when we live particularly in a, in a built up area, everybody's got a cat in their houses and these houses are very close to each other. And so it's very difficult for our cats to carve out a safe place for themselves. And so they will be trying to avoid each other. They don't want to get into any kind of physical conflict if they can avoid it, because physical conflict can lead to all manner of problems that might end in death or losing your territory. And so nobody wants to do that. And so I would imagine if his needs are met and everybody else's needs are met, then nobody has a reason to fight. But that can be really difficult when there's too many cats in the area. So what can we do? We can't persuade him not to fight um, because, you know, that would that would be a tricky thing. But what we can do is we can say, do we have enough resources for him? And can we find places for him to hide and ways for him to access the spaces and places that he wants to go? So could we make the garden really cat friendly? Lots of places to climb, places to hide, places to surveil from, places to look 
sort of from behind things. And sorry, I've got a delay on my camera. So I'm, I'm miming the things that are happening five seconds ago. Um, <laughs> so apologies for that. Um, but, you know, places where he can be seen and or sorry, not be seen, but see what's going on making sure that everything in the house meets his needs. So does he have all the resources that he needs? And we've had so much conversation about that on the on the ICAT care um, channels, enough food, water, litter tray, beds, sleeping, hiding places all around his home so that basically he feels safe and secure and his territory feels like his own and he doesn't feel under threat. Um, that would be my sort of top tips with that. And in an ideal world, you would create a neighborhood group and you would go out and talk to all the other cat owners and tell them to do the same thing. Um, um, so, you know, without diving into a massive behavior consult for um, for Tom, I think make sure he feels safe and he's got everything he wants and needs, places to escape to, places to watch, ways to get to where he wants to be without having to encounter other cats. So that can mean shelves up the fence, um, a tree that he can sort of use for a hop over, all those kind of things. And could he go out the other side of the house instead of always going out the back where the other cats hang out? those kind of things. Um, but I don't know if, if Vicky or anybody else has got things they want to add to that. I agree with you completely, Linda. I think it is an issue uh, for a lot of people. Nobody wants their cats to be out fighting. It's a bit like having children that squabble with neighbours' children. It's awful. You never want to think your kids started it sort of thing. But I think that's very good advice. I think it's all about making sure that they feel they have sufficient in their territory but again, there are so many factors that could influence this because if there's a really dense cat population outside, you know, this poor guy's under a lot of pressure. But um, no, I completely agree. I can't add to that, Linda. Great. So we're ready for our next question. And we've got one from um, Natalie Dowgray, who's in the southwest of England. Um, my boys are very playful, but it sometimes turns to fighting. They're two and a half years old and three and a half years old, and they have free outdoor access. Any advice? I try distracting with a fishing toy. Alex, I'm going to send that one your way, if that's all right. Oh, that's uh, thanks for sending that one to me. I was just thinking, oh, that's a behaviorist question, that is. <laughs> <laughs> well, the reason I sent that to you, actually, because we were having a good discussion over lunch, weren't we, um, about the ages that, that cats um, are social and and in, and can enjoy playing with other cats versus when we get to slightly older and socially mature yeah. um, they're, they're less socially keen and so we can have cats that when they're both young they, they appear to play really well don't they but as one starts to reach that slightly older two to three year kind of bracket and onwards you can have one that's not so interested um, yeah and I guess you could essentially spend a bit more time playing with the, the more playful cat to try and let them kind of engage in some predatory play so that they're not um, you know, uh, doing that with the other cat and, and getting into fights and things. So, yeah. Definitely, definitely. Sense. I think, you know, seeing who's who's the instigator, who's the one that's more playful. Um, and we can't, we don't want to stop him being more playful. He needs an outlet for that. So can we give him a, a different outlet that's not his, his, his other companion so that that cat's feeling safe? Because even though cats can both be playful, they're not always playful to the same degree or at the same periods of time. So we need to be there to, to assess that. And I think the distracting is, is really great, but are there other things you can do as well? For example, um, puzzle feeding one of them, um, giving them opportunity to, to do different activities away from one another and being active away from one another as well. That's great. an important point, isn't it? To making sure that you get time to play with them separately um as well and not sort of doing it together so yeah definitely yeah absolutely definitely good great we've got another question coming through super so this is one from charlotte pace hi everyone i'm an experienced vet nurse and i worry um how much osteoarthritis we miss in practice i wouldn't have known my own gorgeous cat had it unless we had x-rayed him for a non-healing cat bite so i'm going to pick you again alex <laughs> Because now you've got a very, a very medical one. Um, can you can you give some thoughts and comments on that? Yeah, I think um, there's lots and lots of cats out there that um, have osteoarthritis, um, but it's so subtle, um, the changes that occur, and it, it's not always as obvious as it could, might be with a dog, you know. Um, so in, in cats, they, their behaviour might change a little bit, but they might start to favour um, lower sleeping areas, they might play a bit less, they might not want to you know, jump up as much and 
all these kind of subtle changes changes can occur. Um, something that I've used certainly from a veterinary nurse's uh, perspective is the Cat Care for Life um, mobility checklist. Um, and I've used those in practice and actually given them to owners because sometimes when you have that conversation with an owner, they say, oh no, you know, my um, my cat's fine. There's no changes at all. And But when you then go through that chest checklist, they're like, oh, actually, yeah, there have, has been some changes in, in behavior there. Um, so it can be very subtle, but I would recommend talking to your veterinary team um, about it. And actually, even if you're not sure if your cat's having any problems, I think once they get to the age of sort of 11, 12 years old, um, the chances are there's going to be some arthritic changes there. So we need to be making sure that those cats go to the, the vets a bit more frequently and that they're seen, you know, two, three, maybe even four times a year. Yeah. Great. Great. I've just spent some time um, home in Scotland and my mum's got an 18 year old cat and um, I took quite a lot of video footage of him when I was at home because he, he is showing quite a lot of arthritic signs and just my, for my mum just seeing the videos where I could point things out to her and yeah. replay them and pause them and play them back and say do you see what he was like there when he went up that step or going through the cat flap it really really helps so I think videoing can be incredibly useful. Anyone May got any on that? Oh, sorry, <laughs> sorry. Um, hello, Charlotte. Um, I was going to add to that, like Alex, I would say pretty much any cat over the age of 10, I'm going to assume that it has arthritis. Um, and the other thing that I would say is, you know, we put a lot of store, as they would say in Ireland, on x-rays. And we always think, oh, the x-rays will tell us how much pain this cat is in. But they won't. They'll tell us about bony changes. But those bony changes don't necessarily tell us how painful that cat is. And it may be that they've got severe bony changes, but they're actually pretty comfortable or they've got minimal and they're really not comfortable at all. It's not going to tell us a lot about that individual cat's experience. So I think we need to ask the individual cat and, um, and assume pain unless proven otherwise. So we can do analgesia trials if necessary. And I agree with Sarah. I think video is a brilliant um, tool to help us look at then and now. Are they flowing like water or are they kind of thinking about it twice before they make that decision? I think that's really helpful. Right, thanks, Linda. That's a really good point. We've all got a different perception of, of pain, haven't we? It's, it's different for all of us. Super. I think we're ready for our next question. Oh, this is a great question. And I'm going to send this one to you, Zazie. Um, are cat collar bills a form of torture for cats? <laughs> well, that's a great question. And every cat is an individual. So every cat's own response is going to be different. But one of the reasons why cats are often given collar bells to wear is in order to stop them from being able to catch birds. And the idea is that it will give give um, any birds or other prey notice of, of the cat coming up to them. But there's actually been some really interesting recent research that you should know about if that's what you're wanting to do. So a collar bell is not necessarily going to be the best way to go about that. And we know from some recent research that when cats are, pay, are fed a very high protein diet and they're given extra playtime indoors with the one toy, then they are actually less likely to bring prey back home. And so um, maybe a collar bell is not the best way to stop your cat from, from catching prey if that's what you want to do. And another thing is that you can also get um, a cat cat bib that the cat wears around their around their neck which is very bright which birds can spot because it's so bright and that might actually be a better way of stopping cats from catching birds as well because the birds see the bright co colors coming but actually mice and so on don't see it so that's more specific in terms of the prey that's being protected them so your cat may well not enjoy having a bell on their collar it probably will depend on your cat because some cats will just habituate it and get used to the noise and not mind at all whereas other cats may just dislike it um, but if your aim is to stop your cats from catching wildlife there are some other things that you can you can do to help with that that's absolutely great and um th the study that you're talking about was was the one conducted by the university of exeter in the uk wasn't it and what they found for many of those cats is actually some of them would just hold the bell in their mouth so they got really really good at, at, at being very <laughs> at holding the bell or keeping their head at an angle that the bell didn't ring so yeah the bell for some cats it was effective but if we're thinking about the population in general it, it wasn't really great super question Another one, please. Great. So we've got from Sue Pooley here in Hampshire, which is just up the road from International Cat Care's head headquarters. Um, I have two now older cats, Ebony and Tink. They're 14 and 13. 
They seem to be getting fussier and less inclined to stick to the same food for long. But I need to put liquid meds in their food. But when they constantly change their mind about wet food, it's becoming hard to ensure they keep having their meds. Any advice? I know, Vicky, we said we would keep you on the Unknown Cats tonight, but I think given that you've been, <laughs> you've been really involved in our recent inappetence guidelines and, and giving advice for, for um, caregivers, I think this is a question for you, I'm afraid. You know, this is such, hi, Sue. This is such a, a, a big issue with older cats. And I, I think, first of all, I'm, I'm going to look at that word getting fussier, you know, say how much of that is a genuine fussiness about food and how much actually are we involved in that? Because I know as, as um, the older cat I've had until very recently, as she got a bit older, if she dared to sort of walk towards her food bowl and turn her nose up a little bit, I would automatically give something else to her that I thought, well, what if you fancy this instead? You know, there's that sort of psychology that my cats are OK if, you know, they're eating um, and eating with great gusto. So um, I do understand this, but I think we have to be aware of our role in this and how cats get fussier. Um, the most important thing I would say, particularly given their age, is that these lovely preventive health care older cat checks with your vet are really important because there may not be any obvious signs of anything but just checking for dental disease or any other reason why they may go to their bowl and turn their nose up and walk away what have you but clearly i would imagine sue probably is seeing her vet she's got these meds that they have to have in their food anyway um but i think the important thing is to make sure that uh, she finds uh, something it may not be uh, a food as such it may be a treat or a, a particularly palatable pill paste and she uses that specifically for these meds and turns it into something really quite enjoyable and actually do you know what I'm going to introduce Linda here because I wonder whether um, there's some element of really positive training that can be done to help this liquid meds rather than being this medication bad thing that I've got to make you do it can be turned into something positive I hope that's okay Linda yeah I think I think that's great advice from Vicky and I also think I agree I think sometimes ritualizing and creating a positive reinforcement rule structure around medication um, can make it actually a really wonderful part of the cat's day it's a time where they get to interact with you we pair it with something delicious we might pick something which is guaranteed to be delicious every single day and that they're always going to eat like I don't know liver paste or whatever they can have um, or we might actually teach them physically how to take their tablets so I know Sarah does a little bit of every day she uses pill pockets and she'll give them blanks and then one with an empty gel capsule in and then one with you know if they need medication they've already got that skill so if they're not already taking medication, that's really cool if you can pre-train that. But if they're already on medication, we, we maybe might just create that ritual positive reinforcement rule structure around it and then maybe teach them to take empty gel caps as a as a trick. And then once that trick is, is really nice and fluent, you can put the medication into it. So you can put liquid medication into a gel cap. So I wouldn't try and do it with the meds at the moment. I would teach it as a skill. There's lots and lots of great videos on YouTube. And if you look at Chirrups and Chatter with, oh my gosh, what's her name? Chir Tabitha. Chirrups and Chatter. Is it Ingrid? Tabitha. No. Tabitha. Tabitha, Tabitha Crisera. She's got some really nice videos um, on this kind of thing. So you can teach it. But also I would say that, as Vicky said, we can get really obsessed with, oh, my God, they're eating. No, they're not eating. Ah, and we can sort of be a bit helicoptery and inadvertently create um, fussy cats. But we also want to ask, is the medication putting them off? And are we, are we, you know, should we give the medication as a separate event and then leave them alone to enjoy their food? Um, and in addition, you know, could we say, right, after two days, they're going to want something else. So I'm going to swap it and be preemptive with that so that we're not waiting for them to be sick of it. Maybe have three or four different options and gently rotate them around to keep that interest before they give up on it and then keep medication away from food and give it separately with something scrumptious. Yeah, top tips would be would be there. But obviously, if you're having major issues, is there something that needs checked by the vet and, and go back and have that looked at for sure? Hey, super. Thank you very much. I think we've got a, another question coming through. 
This is from Nikki McLeod. Hello, Nikki. Um, can you confirm that cats can be trained? Um, do you want the short answer or the <laughs> long answer? Um, my family are just not convinced that cats cannot be trained like dogs can. I hope this is this is being recorded and we'll be able to share this again. So if your family aren't listening, Nikki, you can share it with them. The short answer is a yes from me. Uh, I think from the rest of our panel, what do we think? Yes. Yeah. yes. <laughs> it's it's a definite yes. And I think one of the things that I personally do when, when friends and family members um, aren't convinced and ask me that question is I, I just start a conversation with them. And I start to ask them about things that their cat does. And, and they'll say, oh, well, the cat can train me. The cat's completely trained me. And I'm thinking, well, if the cat can train you, if it's clever enough to train you, homo sapien, <laughs> then surely we can train the cat. Um, but the best way I think to show people is, is visually rather than try and explain. So, you know, if you can take some, some videos of you training your cats and showing some of the things that they can do and lots of other people as well, because when I first started training my cats, people said, oh, but Sarah Ellis has got special cats. No, I don't have special cats. I've got bog standard cats um, that have not been specifically bred or had early learning in any way that other cats don't have. Um, that any cat can can be trained. It's about what we want to train them. And as Linda can tell us, it's how we do that. And I think for so often, Linda, we found, haven't we, in our work we've done together at International Cat Care on training, is that very often people make the steps too big and they yeah. expect too much too soon. So they think the cats can't learn because of that. But actually, we're just asking too much. Um, you know, we wouldn't ask our children to, to write a 2000 word essay, but we might be over the moon when they start reception and they can write their names. So it's about making those steps really, really small for them. Do you want to add anything to that, Linda? I was going to say as well, you know, we're always trying to compare cats and dogs. And hello, Nikki. Um, I know Nikki knows the answer to this. And <laughs> so we're always trying to compare cats and dogs. But we need to train cats like cats. We need to see them for who they are and what they need and, and meet those needs and work within that framework. And again, I always think about, you know, when I started training, I always thought, oh, look what I can make the cat do. I'm so clever. Look at me with my clicker. Um, whereas now we know it's not about what we can make cats do. It's about what we can do for the cat through positive reinforcement training. And if it's working for the cat, they're going to enjoy it. Um, and again, coming back to that special cat thing, Sarah and I worked on some videos to teach a cat to um, to take their own inhaled medication for asthma. I was working with my little Olive, who I adopted at six, and she was just, you know, from a rescue shelter. She was not, I mean, she's the most special cat, obviously. She's sitting in front of me, so I have to say that. Um, but, you know, any cat can do anything that we set them up for success to do, as long as it's in their best interest and it serves their welfare. So, Yes. Do they know the sound of the bag of their food opening? Yes, they've learned that. We've trained it. Go go train. <laughs> brilliant, brilliant. I can see Nikki's comments here. And she says, I should have just I should just give them your book, Sarah. Hopefully you've entered our competition and got a chance to win one and you can send it to them and, and send them Zazies, Zazies as well. <laughs> so they've got the science behind it all as well. But no, that's great. Super. Um, next question. Um, from Laura, Laura Watson, who actually works with us. It's lovely to hear from you, Laura. Um, how can I support my cat, who is a super senior cat that is now starting to show signs of being disorientated and yowling at random times throughout the day and night, please? Um, and Laura is a, a registered vet nurse. She's in the UK. Um, Alex, do you want to have a shot at that one? Yes. Hello, Laura. <laughs> um, I guess if this was a question coming from a member of the public and it wasn't Laura, I, I would always recommend getting a vet check first to make sure that there was no underlying medical issues with that. Um, cats can get cognitive dysfunction syndrome, so they can get a, a kind of form of senility and they can sometimes um, show these signs with that, but there are other medical conditions that can show that too. Um, I think when it comes to older cats, it can be quite nice to try and stick to a routine um, and just, just keep things kind of... they they don't like change and they can get a little bit sort of upset when there's change as well um i have uh, read some information before and this sometimes there can be certain triggers with cats that can cause some of these sort of yowling um episodes as well um and it might be um things like daylight or certain noises or things outside and things that can make the cat a little bit sort of excited if you like and it can trigger these kind of behaviors as well um you could also try um 
I think um, there's some information and, and studies out there that show that um, actually getting older cats to engage in things like puzzle feeding can be really useful as well. Um, it can kind of help with that cognitive decline that they can get when they get older too. Um, so you could try and keep keep the cat busy with a, a little bit of puzzle feeding as well, providing um, you started with something straightforward first and kind of built up to maybe a bit of a more difficult level. So yeah, there would be some things I'd definitely consider. Great, that's super. Some of the things that I've found personally that's worked quite well with when we've had super seniors is providing them additional sources of heat. Yeah. Um, just somewhere, you know, heat mats that they, they can rest and, and it just tends to relax them um, and, and keep them a bit more chilled out. But um, let's hear, um, Linda, have you got any more on that? Because I know you're a, a big support, fan of our yeah. babies. I would support exactly what you both said. Consistency, making sure that we don't move things around all over the house, mm. making sure that we keep everything nice and nice and um, predictable for the cat in both the routines, the social interactions and the environment. Comfort, warmth, setting them up in a quiet, safe space so that they're not kind of getting lost in the middle of the night. They know where to find everything. Everything's, you know, close enough and, and safe. Um, and again, check with the vet because there are lots of medical conditions in addition to cognitive dysfunction that could be that could be causing yeah. issues there like blood pressure, thyroid, um, various other things or just, you know, we could have trained it by accident. Um, so there's lots that could be going on there. But I think, yeah, you guys have covered it really. Great. Thank you very much. We're ready for our next question. We have a fantastic member of the team working behind the scenes, firing mm -hmm. the questions towards us. <laughs> oh gosh, Ashika, I'm hoping I've pronounced your name correctly. Um, she's asking about a totally indoor environment or an indoor outdoor setup, which is better for a pet cat? Now, this is a fantastic question and a question that can create great debate um, depending on where we are in the world um, and because of that I think I might put this question to you Zazie because you're, you're based in Canada aren't you um, and and it's much more common to have cats indoor only there than it is in the UK so can you give us a bit of a, a pros and cons and and she also asks us what are the chances of the cat catching an infection when um, on walks on a harness so maybe you could just talk a wee bit about walking on a harness as, as a, a thing, the pros and cons of that, and then go on to the, the infection part. Sure. So this is a great question. And actually, it's a huge question. Like you say, there's a lot of debate about this. So I, as you can tell from my accent, I grew up in the UK. And when I lived in the UK, I would never have imagined keeping a cat indoors only. And now I live in Canada and my cats are indoors only because it's simply not safe for them to be outside. Because where I live, we have... Um, well, the main threat would be coyotes, but also we have cougars um, and bobcat even might perhaps be, be a threat as well. And for me, it just doesn't seem safe to let my cat outdoors. But what that means is if you have your cat in a totally indoor environment, actually, that's quite barren. Your cat can't leave and go and spend time outside if they don't like it indoors. Um, they can't go out and walk through the log grass and see butterflies and birds and so on. So you have to do a lot of work to make sure that your home is set up right for your cat. And so that you have lots of high up spaces, you make sure that you're meeting what's called the five pillars and you'll find information on that in ICATCARE's wonderful resources. Um, and in addition, you need to be providing extra enrichment. So for example, Sarah Ellis has this wonderful idea that she writes about in the trainable cat of bringing in a sensory box, of bringing things in from outside to give your cat the choice of interacting with them or not if they want to. You will need to make extra time to play with your cat because play is very important for all cats, but it's especially important for your indoors only cat to make sure that they don't get bored. You will really want to make sure that you're feeding them with puzzle feeders again because you don't want them to get bored. It's so easy for a cat to get bored if they're indoors only. And if it's not safe for them to go outside, but you want to give them some outdoors access, you can take them for walks on a harness, but you might also be really lucky and be able to build a catio for them. And if you can do that, that's wonderful. Or if you can at least have a setup with a window that's safe where you can sometimes let the cat be at the window and have fresh air come in, for example, that can be helpful. If you want to take your cat for walks on a harness so you can train them. You will want to train them very carefully and train them to walk around the house in the harness before you even start to venture outside. And the other thing that you want to make sure you've got is something safe 
that you take with you because a cat's response to something stressful is to run and hide. So you want to have a safe space, which might be a nice cat carrier that you're actually like a soft, soft one that you can easily carry with you or a backpack that you're going to carry with you that is already a safe space for your cat. Um, and then if anything stressful happens, they're not going to run away. They're going to run into the rucksack or, or whatever that safe space is that you've got for you got for them and obviously of course make sure it's a safe space where you're walking like even if I was to go outside and walk my cat on a harness here there would be a lot of loose dogs running up so I, that's something that I would have to think about so you need to think about the environment where you're walking your cat on a leash as well and in terms of infection so I'm not a vet but that's something you should speak to your vet about because they are still going to be recommending vaccinations for your cat even though they're indoors only um, because um, it's still important for them to get vaccinated. And I mean, this is something you've talked about for a long time, but that's probably the, the gist of it. <laughs> Brilliant. Thank you so much, Zazie. And it's it's reminded me to remind everybody that um, all of the infographics that we've been sharing for the last three weeks in our build up to International Cat Day are available um, along with lots and lots of other resources. So um, web pages and, and how to videos are all on our homepage at ICAT icatcare.org yeah, and click on the tab for International Cat Day and you can download all of those so some of the stuff that Zazie's been talking about how to play with your cat even what type of carrier might be good if you do choose to walk your cat outdoors and um, all those kinds of things are there. Zazie just one thing for, for our listeners that maybe don't know what a catio is could you explain what that is? Yes, a catio is a lovely fenced enclosure, um, often something which is built onto your house or with a walkway from your house. So, for example, if you have a porch, some people might simply enclose the porch with fencing so the cat can go in there and you can put plants in there and, and cat trees and, and shells for your cats to climb on. And it's a safe space that your cat can't get out of. Nothing else can come into. Um, and it's just a safe space for your cat to be indoors. And they can be quite expensive. You can get ready-made ones that you just kind of attach onto your house, or you can hire a local carpenter to make one for you. And I don't have one. I would love to have one. I would absolutely love to do that. But as well as enclosing a patio, sometimes people build walkways like along the outside of the house, nice and high up for the cat, because cats like to be high up. And it's just a really nice, safe way to give your cat access to the outdoors. And there is some research on it which shows that cats enjoy having catios they use the catios if, if you make one for them so if you're if it's not safe for your cat to go outside it's a lovely way to give them outdoors access which is safe brilliant brilliant and for people who maybe don't live in areas where there are the risk of predators but they're worried about some of the other concerns to safety for their cats for example things like road traffic accidents we and if they have a garden they've also got the option to cat proof fence their garden that's something that we see quite common in the uk now for people who have done a bit of a risk assessment and feel that the risks are, are too high but want to give their cat access to the outdoors and really good for cats that maybe have some sensory impairment or some physical disability as well so there's lot there's lots and lots of options there but I think we always feel that every single cat is an individual so we can't blanket say what's best without knowing that individual cat and not just the individual cat but the individual environment in which it's in because where we live is, is so diverse and the, and the risks, the pros and cons can be incredibly diverse too. Um, but do go on our website because we've got some really nice um, pages in our advice sections that talk you through all the different pros and cons so you can work out what's best for you and your cat. Super, right, I think we're ready for another question. April, here we've got a question about vaccines. How often should cats be vaccinated? My cats don't leave the house and I vaccinate them every two years. Is that wrong? Alex, I'm going to fire that one your way. <laughs> Thanks. Um, I think that is a very good question, actually. And I think nowadays um, for vets, they vaccinate on a what we call like a risk benefit basis. Um, so certainly the kitten vaccinations are really important in that first year. And after that, it really depends on that particular cat's lifestyle. Um, so it wouldn't be necessarily that vaccinating every two years is wrong. If you've had that discussion with your vet and they've said, OK, your cat's an indoor cat um, and, you know, we, we don't feel that it's necessary, then that's that's fair enough. I think it's very much down to the vet and the owner and that cat's lifestyle um, as to how frequently we should be vaccinating. Having said that, um, I do feel that the health check that goes along with the vaccination is just as important as the vaccination. And that 
is something that we should be doing at least yearly with cats. And as I said earlier, once they get older, we need to be looking at doing that much more frequently, you know, two, three, four times a year. So it's not just about the vaccine. It's about that health check that goes with it as well. Super. Brilliant. Thank you very much. As we go on to our next question, I just want to say um, thank you to everybody that's sending their hellos to us. We've got hellos from the UK, from Sweden, from Santiago and Chile, from Canada. So it's absolutely fantastic to have so many people from around the globe join us tonight. And I don't know what time it is in all those different countries, but we really, really appreciate you being with us. OK, we're ready for our next question building suspense up on this one. Here we go. So this one, oh, it's specifically for you, Vicky. <laughs> um, this is from Sam Taylor in the UK. She's a vet. She actually uh, works with us as well. So it's great that we've got some of our supporters. Um, as with dogs, we are seeing unknown cats um, brought to the UK from abroad and adopted as pets. And I think that's something that in the UK, our most recent poll report really highlighted is how many are being brought in. I was really quite surprised at the statistics of how many were but it's often well-meaning people or charities bringing them in so you know it's people that are that love cats and are wanting to do the best by cats but maybe don't recognize some of the problems so sam's asking us what problems do you see with this from a behavior point of view and is it becoming more common yeah hi sam uh, great question and it is of concern and i think sarah is absolutely right i think the people who organize this and the charities that get involved do it for the right reasons and we have to bear in mind that when you're confronted with a situation in the country of origin that seems absolutely impossible to deal with then when somebody offers you a lifeline for that cat to have a chance somewhere else you grab it but like a lot of things in this world, it's not quite that straightforward. It's not quite that black and white. And I know that, I mean, I have to think back to my um, 20 odd years uh, working as a clinical behaviorist and seeing the problems there that I encounter with cats that have been imported. And I think we have to bear in mind, just put ourselves in that individual cat situation. Quite often, these cats are taken from what I would refer to as free roaming stock you know these are unowned street cats who don't have um the the strong pet genetics and they don't have that all very valuable sort of early experience with people what they often have is that sort of street wise i recognize people are good for food therefore i'll tolerate you know being handled by them or i'll be friendly to them on the street and that's seen as a sign of their generalized sociability to people and they think yes this cat is great i love it i'm going to ship it home then you have the issue of the the travel which is incredibly stressful for them these cats have probably never been confined in anything before let alone taking part in a journey we also have to bear in mind that we're possibly taking them to a different climate we're taking them to a very different lifestyle and we're taking them to an environment with a very different dynamics of, of cats in the outside world either they're going to a multi-cat household because it's often cat lovers who bring them home or they're going out into a a garden where there's all sorts of things happening with strange cats in their territory they don't know how to handle irrespective of the potential of, of bringing diseases into the country that our own population or that countries population are not uh, used to and don't have any immunity to, they have to deal with this massive change in their life and also living as a pet. And the sort of problems I saw, probably every type of problem behavior that owners experience that are associated with this chronic sense of distress and their inability to predict or control what's happening to them. And it's incredibly sad because the people who bring them over are cat lovers. They love the cat. They want to do the best by them. But you've got this really unfortunate situation where the cats are mismatch. So I think I would say to people, there are always stories of, of great successes and I don't deny those and that's great. But I think when you're looking at issues like this, wherever you can, let's look to the country of origin uh, to actually say, what can we do to stop this being an ongoing problem? Otherwise, we just play Groundhog Day. We're, we're constantly trying to 
put a sticky plaster on something we should be addressing in the country of origin. That's where these cats, that's where their genes are, uh, and that's the, the climate they're used to and the environment they're used to. Um, it's a really tricky one, and thanks for bringing it up, Sam. It is, a, it is an issue. Um, so I don't know if anybody else has got anything to say on that. But No, that's, that's great, Vicky, and I think the more that we can share information across different countries so that we can help cats in the countries that they reside in and bring in that knowledge and that skill and, and support each other, most yeah. importantly, I think, yeah. um, will we'll help that realisation that we can help cats in different countries, but we should help them stay in that country and, and, and have better welfare within their, their origin country. So I think that was a great answer, Vicky. Thanks so much. OK, I think our next question, um, this is from Nicola. Hi, how can I stop my one-year-old cat from stealing food from our plates? I, I have that problem with my children, never alone my cats. <laughs> and I do feed them often as well. He's fed five times per day with a puzzle feeder and is a healthy cat. So that's fantastic that you're doing a regular frequent feeding, you're using puzzle feeding, um, so you're giving that sort of cognitive stimulation. You've checked the cat's healthy, but he's still stealing food. <laughs> Linda, I'm gonna put that one to you. Hello, Nicola. Um, that's a great question. And it's, you know, we we had this when we first adopted Olive. We She had hollow legs and she wanted to eat everything. And I remember her stealing a lump of cabbage off my off my husband's plate and eating it. And I, I had never seen anything like that. Um, so I feel your pain. Um, and so what I would advise a client and what we did in our situation is, yes, we used all of those activity feeders and those puzzle feeders and we gave her lots to do and we did lots of play, which it sounds as though you've have already done. Um, we addressed her nutritional needs. And again, we always want to make sure that's, you know, on, on underway in our baseline. But then we, we got smart with how we used our puzzle feeders. We didn't just sort of feed her and then forget about her and then go and prepare our dinner, by which time she was finished and bored. We made sure that as our dinner went on the table, her puzzle feeder went up to her room so she could be enjoying that in her space away from us. And gradually we worked towards, she would start seeing us put our dinner on the table and run up to her room and wait, because obviously she has her own room, and wait for her puzzle feeder to be presented. And we gave her something different every day or every meal. We rotated, we changed everything around so that it was always engaging and fun. Um, so that's one solution is just, you know, that's the kind of management solution. Give the cat the puzzle feeder while you are eating in a different place. The other is you could get smart with training. And so you could teach her to station on a, on a comfy rug or a bed somewhere near you and to really teach relaxation and calm around people who are eating. And that would be the longer term project that you could work on. So management in the beginning in terms of when you feed and how you feed. Sounds like you're already on the right lines. It just needs tweaking a little bit um, in terms of the timing and then long term teach settle on a mat when the humans are eating go chill over there and you could do just the management bit that would be just fine but if you wanted to be really smart you could do the training bit too <laughs> great super and i think there's there's puzzle feeders now we've got such a a range on the market and of course we can make them as well and we've got lots of those resources on our international cat day page that you can have a look at but one of the, i also had a cat that had hollow legs and he didn't eat a cabbage but he did eat the very first international cat care meeting i came to and i met with vicky and he ate a packet of crackers out the kitchen cupboard may i add <laughs> Um, he opened, he made his own puzzle feeder. So I, I feel your pain. But one of the things I learned very quickly with him was about the difficulty levels with puzzle feeders, because actually he was a master puzzle feeder. So he could he could clear the, one of those puzzle feeders so fast and then be right up at my plate by the time I just cut my first potato. Um, so working out um, how to make things a bit more difficult for him and, and not using the stationary puzzle feeders, using ones that were much more active because you've got a, a, a one-year-old cat, so very young, very active, or also hiding food around the house as well. So again, getting them to move away from where you are. I found those things really, really useful. Um, brilliant. Yeah. Super Treasure different. hunts. Treasure hunts could be great. Just a little ball of paper. You can have 10 or 11, 12 balls of paper with a bit of food in the middle and dot them all around the house. And that takes up a lot of time and brain power. So yeah, great idea. Great, super, thank you. Have we got another question coming through? This one is from Amy. 
Oh, another great question. Is it possible to teach an adult cat to play? I love that question because we very often get asked or get told, my adult cat does not play. I've tried and they will not play. And if you can, if you're visiting that home, as, as many of us have done in times and, and demonstrated how to play with the cat, um, often owners are amazed that suddenly this cat will play. So you're saying you're looking after one that won't do more than swat at toys if they get close to him. Um, I'm going to put that question, well, I'm going to put that question to two of you, I think, because first of all, I think there's a, a, a medical check there. Um, so I'm going to just pass that one perhaps to Alex, just to think about what might be some of the health reasons why a cat might not play. And then if you can pass it on to Zazie, I think Zazie, you can um, help teach us the best ways to play with a cat. Yeah, absolutely. I think I'd, I'd want to be getting a health check done first at the vets just to make sure there wasn't an underlying health issue um, and certainly anything anything really that can affect that cat's mobility obviously osteoarthritis springs to mind first but um, you know there could be other things <coughs> biological problems and, and other things that, that could cause problems with that cat's mobility so um, health check would be yeah the number one thing that I'd, I'd want to check. <coughs> Just to add to that as well, Alex, I've, I've prompted you to talk about physical health, but also just thinking about that cat's um, mental well-being as well, isn't it? Because we know play comes, it's a positive behavioural state, if you like. It's a, it's a positive emotional state. So if a cat's not wanting to play, we just need to make sure that it's not in some kind of chronic state of stress as well, don't yes. we? Yeah, definitely. And, you, you, you know, certainly... Um, from a veterinary point of view, you could do a little bit of um, sort of questioning just to find out a bit about that cat's home environment and, and what's going on at home um, as well, just in case you did need to give any advice or refer on to a, a clinical animal behaviourist too. Absolutely. Every time you try to play, it's a multi-cat household and the cat's ambushed because exactly. the younger cats want to play. Yeah. Then <laughs> It's a good reason that one might not want to. But right, Zazie, give us your top tips for how to play with your cat. OK, well, first of all, I want to echo what you both have just said, because the question says I'm looking after one. So that implies to me that this cat is not a permanent inhabitant of the home, in which case it may simply be that they're not feeling very safe. And I would look at the environment again, check out those five pillars in the cat friendly resources and make sure that you're doing all you can to make the cat feel safe in the home. And especially that they have high up spaces and hiding spaces that, that they can go to if they're stressed. And then apart from that, so cats like to have a range of different toys representing different prey types. So they, the toy mouse is obviously ubiquitous, but you can get big things like toy rabbits that give them a chance to kick with their back legs. You can get toy snakes, all kinds of things, things with feathers sticking out like toy birds. And the thing is, some cats kind of specialize. They prefer a specific type of toy and other cats are more generalist and they like to have a wide range of toys. And the other thing is that perhaps you're trying to play with this cat with a one toy. And a very common mistake that people make with a one toy is in taking it up to the cat. And what you need to remember and bear in mind with the one toy is that th the thing on the end of it is meant to be acting as if it's a real prey item and like a mouse doesn't typically run up to the cat unless there's something wrong with them usually they're running away or they're at some distance from it so you need to be moving the toy away from the cat and not necessarily all in a, a straight straight line or not necessarily all at a constant speed it might vary so try and pretend that that the thing on the end of the one toy is an actual prey creature and move it around like that um, and also bear in mind that if your cat is simply watching that in itself is a good start because the mm. first part of the cat getting into play is them watching and staring at it and sometimes people tell me that the cat doesn't really do anything apart from watch but if they are watching that in itself is is a good thing and a good sign and you can probably then build on that and get them to get more interested um, in that and especially with an older cat or a cat with some kinds of medical issues they may actually spend a lot more time watching and as they get older they'll be less likely to be leaping into the air and that's perhaps the bit that we expect from it so the other thing is to adjust your expectations slightly and unless this is a kitten don't really expect them to be leaping into the air and doing acrobatics all of the time they might be watching for quite a bit and then and then chasing and pouncing um, so don't expect too much take it slowly and be very careful practice see it as a skill for you to learn in terms of moving the, the toy away from the cat that's absolutely brilliant Zazie I love that 
definitely we've we've got to become skilled in in moving that pre haven't we yeah <laughs> i think i love what you said there because when we're playing with cats we're trying to mimic the predatory sequence and the first part of that predatory sequence is the seek and the search it is the watching it is the looking so that is a part of play it may not be the fun active chasing pouncing swatting batting stuff but it is a part of play so that's really good advice and the other thing i was just thinking as you were talking is um I think we can become very skilled as, as the, the battery operated part of the toy at not letting the cat capture the toy um, and tweaking it out the way. But actually, if we think about how many prey cats do catch in the wild, it, they have to catch quite, quite a number in order to be able to survive. So they are successful at being hunters. So we need to give them that opportunity to be successful in the home as well. Um, so make sure that there's lots of that intermittent reinforcement that you do let them catch the toy on many times. And once they catch it, don't try and tweak it out straight away. Let them bite it, let them bunny kick it with their back legs, let them manipulate it um, because that's all really, really reinforcing. And if they're successful in doing that, they're gonna think they're good hunters. And and they're going to have a bash at, at doing it again so that was great thank you very much right i think we've got time we've got 10 minutes left so we've got some time for a few more questions and if we don't get to all of your questions tonight if we've got some left um don't worry because we should be able to answer those um by text we'll type the answers to you over the next day or so now linda i see you've had a bit of a cough bless you so i <laughs> don't want to ask you a question if you're needing a bit more time you're I'm good. okay <laughs> but I feel this is this is a question that could involve quite a training element so I'm going to put this one to you we've got um Sarah Alice here asking us I love that Sarah Alice and Sarah Ellis um asking should I brush my cat's teeth <clears throat> Thank you, Sarah. And hello, Sarah. Yes, sorry, I had, had a moment of coughing. Um, yes, if you can, go for it. Um, I think really, if you speak to any of the veterinary dentists, they would say that abrasion is the thing that really matters to prevent tartar and plaque building up. So by abrasion, we mean that physical brushing activity. So in an ideal world, we would all be brushing all of our cats and dogs teeth just the same as we do our own every single day. And that would prevent that build up and maintain that mouth health and gum health. So from a physical perspective, I'm sure Alex and Vicky would agree, it's the right thing to do. Um, in reality, it's pretty tricky. And I don't know, um, Alex and Vicky, do you guys brush your cat's teeth? No. no. <laughs> I don't either. <laughs> Big confession here, right? I could if I wanted, but I have chosen to focus my training on other things. But it's actually very, very straightforward to train. We just have to be really careful in terms of how we go about it. So building it very, very slowly and gently. Alex and I had a conversation about this last year, and I made some sort of baseline training videos to get started. And what we would do initially would be begin with having the cat feel just comfortable with you touching any part of their head or face and then release and feed a treat over and over again so that contact with your hands on their head or their face predicted something lovely coming their way. So that's how you would begin. You wouldn't begin with diving in there with a toothbrush in their mouth. You would just begin with, are you comfortable with me touching you here or here or here? Yes, feed. So that's where we would start. And then you might use something with texture to touch them with, like a toothbrush. Um, but you might also um, choose, you know, anything with texture just to get them used to the concept of having something different on their bodies. And then you would touch them with the brush thing and then release and feed. And gradually we would move closer and closer to the mouth so that you could then touch the muzzle and release and feed. You might lift the lip, release and feed. And then gradually when that's easy, hold your finger there for a second or three, release and feed. When that's easy, bring the texture into the mouth side of things. But again, little tiny toothbrush. You know, we don't want to go in there with a great big man sized toothbrush. We want to, to think little tiny, tiny toothbrush. Um, <clears throat> and you can even just have a little piece of um, microfleece cloth on the end of your finger to begin with to bring in that texture. And just really just hold your finger there for a second, release and feed and gradually work towards the tiniest bit of movement. So just rotating your finger, even just half a, half a clock turn or a quarter of a clock turn, release and feed. And then we would gradually work towards the back of the mouth. I think the, the current evidence says that if you're, if you're getting the, the outside aspects of the teeth, that's good enough. We don't have to get in and get to the inside aspects of the teeth, but that's where the most tartar is going to build up. So that makes it easier for us. 
But I think by the nature of the smallness of cats, ha cats' heads and cats' faces and the fact that they don't have flip top heads, you know, we have to just take it really, really slow and carefully and build it really slowly and, and never let it get to a point where they're pulling their heads away from you because that tells us that we've gone too far too fast and we've made it hard for them. We want to make it easy. And when we change the criteria, it has to be so gentle that the cat doesn't even notice it's a tiny bit harder. Um, and again, we've got some lovely videos on the iCat Care YouTube channel showing the beginnings of teaching these things um, so that you can get those first steps. I know Alex has done a little bit of work, I think, with, with your cat. I've done a little bit of work with my cat. So if you look at our social channels, you'll see those beginning bits as well um, and take it really slow. But yeah, we should all be doing it. Whether we are is, is another matter, but <laughs> we, we can and we should. <laughs> Great. We have to pick the things we need to train, don't we, Linda? We can't train yeah. everything all at once. So yeah. it's yeah. stealing it's cabbage off plates comes first. <laughs> <laughs> Great. Okay. I think we've got time for maybe one, possibly two more questions. Here we've got one come through here. Oh, I think this might be one for you, Vicky. If rescues could do one thing to improve cat welfare, what would that be? I love that question. Very profound. It's a great question. It's quite almost philosophical, isn't it? Really? Mm -hmm. And it's very difficult to pick one thing. But I suppose I would probably pick something that was easy to do because it's a tough enough job as it is. People are always working absolutely flat out. There's always some kind of crisis going on. It's, a, it's you know, it's a tough sector to work in. So it would have to be something that's easy. And obviously, financial resources are always restricted to so something uh, cheap or free. So those two criteria. So putting those two together and thinking about the nature of the species that you're looking after, um, I would say cardboard boxes. And I'd say cardboard boxes in the cats' cages or pens mm -hmm. as a really important way for them to, to be able to control their environment at a time when everything's out of control. And the species really love to have that sense of predictability and control. And if they see a danger, and unfortunately sometimes they perceive us as that danger, they want to escape from us. They can't because we put them in a cage. So their next best option is to avoid us and therefore to hide. Put a cardboard box in, turn it on its side away from uh, uh, the front of the cage and there they have a choice. I choose to remain hidden until I feel safer. So I think that um, that would be the one thing bearing in mind all the factors that, that influence uh, the wonderful people who work in rescue throughout the world. I think it would be give your cat somewhere to hide and can I add a second one? Second thing, uh, get them out as soon as possible. Have a plan for them when you take them in and get them out. It's uh, it's part of their journey when they stay with you, not their destination. So always, cats, always not think boxes. about Yeah. Yes, <laughs> I'm sorry. The cats, not the boxes. The boxes <laughs> always recycle like what us the people do. Sorry. It's getting a bit late in the day. I'm saying dog things. <laughs> <laughs> no, that's, that's brilliant advice, Vicky. And I was thinking as you were talking, it's not just a hiding place, the cardboard box, is it? The cardboard box, it's very insulating, so it can be warm. And there's been studies to show that cats prefer cardboard in terms of some of the substrates you can provide them. Yeah. It also impregnates scent really well. Yeah. So the scent from their paws, the scent when they facial rub, it can smell like home for them. And if you've got a sturdy cardboard box, they can perch on the top as well. So you can't beat a cardboard box really and it is free and it's recyclable it's about the best thing in the world as far as cats are concerned exactly and that's recycling it as in not giving it to another cat because obviously it's going to smell but recycling it in your recycling bin yes for it to be reborn as another brand new cardboard box yes. another cat somewhere in the world Perfect. we have one minute left and i'm really keen for us to squeeze in one more question if we can because i see we've still got quite a few we've got a thank you now from um and a hello from argentina which is lovely and um, have we got time for one more our behind the scenes we've got people working very hard helping us here oh wow and you've given me one that i'm not sure i can pronounce the name z Gansby? I hope I've got that right. That's a difficult one for me. Um, hello, my cat seems to enjoy the one toys and the play interaction, I guess. 
but tends to chew through the string of those toys. Oh, yes, that can be quite a common thing, particularly when the string's made of elastic. Should I worry about it? And does it mean he'd like chewy food? Can I give that one to you, Alex, before you disappear completely? I know. I'm, I'm fully aware that I'm, it's getting darker and darker in this room. <laughs> and I'm, I'm just like a floating head. <laughs> I'm liking your energy Enjoy. conservation that you're doing. <laughs> yeah, I'm doing it for doing it for the planet. Um, yeah, that's a really good question, isn't it? I mean, there is always a risk that a cat could chew um, the, the string part of those toys and, and they can be genuinely, you know, really, really dangerous. They can kind of get caught in the cat's intestine and concertina up and, and cause all sorts of problems. Um, I mean, I think the number one thing is only use those toys supervised with cats and make sure that they are put away afterwards. Um, you can get different types of... Um, I say string, but different types of material um, that, that you use on the wand toys. Um, I know my cats have got one that's made out of plastic, um, so it tends to be a little bit more hardy. Um, so it's worth having a look around, having a shop around and, and seeing what different types of materials are out there. Um, and also trying different toys as well. I mean, we know a lot of cats do, do like the wand toys, but there's lots of other toys that you can get for um, sort of object play and things like that. Um, but I think the, the one key thing is to make sure that those toys are put away um, when you're not around and you only do it, yeah, just supervised, using supervised. Yeah, definitely. I um, My cats also like the ones that are on wire because they sort of swoop through the air a bit more and they yeah. can't be chewed through. But I also think, I, I'm not, personally, I'm not a massive fan of the one toys that come on, on the elastic that they chew through because I tend to find that they often have toys at the end that are quite heavy. Yeah. And so they bounce quite a lot on the elastic. It's and then I think, up. exactly. And the yeah. elastic seems to be the bit that does the right kind of the movement rather than the toy on the end. So the cat becomes a bit more fixated on the, the elastic and they, they want to hold that and chew that instead of the toy. So I think exploring other types of interactive one toys that are, that are out there and, as you said, not leaving them with them so they're not getting that opportunity to chew through because that can be quite dangerous. Brilliant. Can I also add to, um, sorry, I was just going to add that the chewing through the string doesn't necessarily mean that they, they would prefer a chewy food. Um, which was part of part of that as well. And I think what they're doing is running through the predatory sequence. So they're they're catching it, they're killing it, they're manipulating it, and then they're destroying and, and dissecting it. So I think it's just part of play. Mm -hmm. And as Alex said, you know, as long as it's safe and supervised and we're never allowing our cats to eat that string or get themselves into difficulty or get it hooked around the back of their tongues or anything like that, sometimes our one toys just have loads and loads of knots in them. And that's part of the fun <laughs> and, that, and that can be okay as long as they're safe as well I think so so I don't think it's that your cat's missing out on any any kind of particular texture in their food I think it's just part of the play um if that makes sense great thank you Linda that's a really good point so I think that's going to bring us to a close sadly we've still got quite a few questions to answer and we'll, we'll do the best for that thank you so much for for all your comments we're getting some comments through saying it's still light up here in North Wales so it's just us <laughs> down in the southwest of England that's in the dark <laughs> Um, uh, wonderful panel and discussion happy international cat day everyone thank you so much feline legends thank you so much everyone lots of lovely messages coming on um, thank you a huge thank you to our panel a huge thank you to the people working behind the scenes that have made this happen and got the questions yeah. coming up and got the technology working and a huge thank you to all of you out there who have joined us today to help celebrate International Cat Day and that are with us on that journey about learning more about cats. Every time we do one of these things, we learn lots um, yeah. and we're all learning together. So a huge thank you for joining us um, and we hope to see you again. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you. Bye.